Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benuni. You're watching Israeli News Live. The Russian-China relationship, is it prophetic? Tonight's broadcast is going to lean more towards the two witnesses than the Russian-Chinese relationships and what's going on there. And even the talk about starting the two-state process all over again with John Kerry and Prime Minister Netanyahu in Rome of all places this week. You're going to really want to pay attention to tonight's broadcast, a very prophetic broadcast indeed, and it is going to totally stir your hearts if you are believers in Yeshua, if you have watched yourself for the coming of the two witnesses, tonight is going to really, really begin to shake your way of thinking in what we're about to speak about tonight. Let's get right into the broadcast as we go right here. An article, uh, this is from CNN, but it was actually shared with me by another uh, friend there that sent me an email from the Times of Israel speaking about this uh, meeting between John Kerry and Prime Minister Netanyahu in Rome of all places, which of course I've always held to it that Rome is that main power, that driving force, an antichrist type spirit. And if it's not if it's not Pope Francis, believe me, there'll only be another one. And I know there's some that would say, well, with the e with the British leaving the EU, this cracks up the whole idea of the Pope being the antichrist and him. Uh, bringing together a the one a one world order. Well, no, it doesn't either. I guess people forget that the Pope of Rome, his main objective has been the United Nations, and this is something he's been very effective in doing. But you have to remember, Yeshua is going to come step on the throne here, and that's what's going to trouble the Pope of Rome. Uh, as he uh, realizes that the tidings that are coming out of the East have more to do with the coming of Christ than it has to do with the Chinese or the Russians for that matter. Let's take a look at the article though here. And don't forget, as I brought to you not long ago by Shimon Tov in the interview with him, there had already been a two-state solution signed by former Ariel Sharon. It's his own former aide. Uh, had revealed to uh, Shimon Tov at a prayer meeting group that he had there in Israel, said, said hysterically, as she calmed down from her weeping and crying, as she said in the meeting with the United States representatives present with Ariel Sharon, that there had been a two-state solution signed by the Israeli authorities. Ariel Sharon signed it, a two-state solution into law. And then, though, not right after I or right before I'd had this interview, I'd already been there with Pastor Paul Bagley on his uh, filming for his uh, the coming apocalypse uh, television show, a meeting with Rabbi Yehuda Glick there at the Knesset. And uh, we were there. I was doing the filming, and then Rabbi Yehuda Glick makes the statement that it is over. There is no more two-state solution. Thought that was interesting, even in his wording, there is no more, which clearly identifies, he acknowledges that there was a two-state solution signed, and this is the reason why, as it was also agreed and concurred with Shimon Tov, why we have seen all the infrastructure for a two-states, for a Palestinian and Israeli state for, for, for many, many years now, including Highway 1 coming up from uh, Tel Aviv into Jerusalem, this eco-bridge, as it's called, which clearly can be used as a checkpoint for Jews that would be coming into their own city. And I believe this exactly what it's going to be. There's others that have shared the same sentiment with me. We'll only have to wait and see what happens. But nonetheless, low expectations for Kerry's Netanyahu meeting in Rome, says CNN. Says uh, the clock running out of his time in office and, and violence between Israelis and Palestinians dimming the prospects of a Mideast peace deal. Secretary of State John Kerry will try this weekend to salvage one of his most uh, important key foreign policy initiatives as international pressure mounts for a resumption of talks between, a, uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, remember... Uh, I brought this out as well when you, uh, Rabbi Glick had actually made the statement, quoting Prime Minister Netanyahu at that meeting with Pastor Bagley there, that he said you cannot have a marriage without the bride and the bridegroom present. Now, he was speaking about the French negotiations there, trying to set up a two-state solution, almost force it in, without either party present. 
Of course, we know Daniel's prophecy in chapter 11, believe us, verse 14, they tried to marry the vision. Who is it? The sons of the lawless are trying to marry that vision. And of course, those sons, as I always knew, Shimon Perez being one, but I never knew the other son because it was plural. And that was Ariel Sharon. Well, they did try to marry the vision, but the prophecy goes on to say they shall stumble. And that's where Rabbi Yehuda Glick comes in with the Likud party, part of Netanyahu's party there. They don't want the deal any longer. They're trying to cause it to stop altogether. Because why? They may not be part of the sons of the lawless, but Ero Sharon and Shimon Perez definitely are. So we see Daniel's prophecy is really getting in high gear here. But I want to share something with you out of Daniel's prophecy perhaps you've never looked at before. And it was something that just I don't even want to say as an off chance. I really believe that God was dealing with me on this recently. I know he was. I know he was dealing with me because it was something that bothered me. And it was actually in verse 44 about the tidings. Let me just read to you uh, chapter 11, verses 43, 44, and 45, and then we'll get right into this. He says, But he shall have power over the treasuries of gold and of silver and over the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Without a doubt, I have proven that the Vatican actually fulfills this prophecy here. Now, but let's go on, though. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall, verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. That's pretty, pretty straightforward there. Now, most people know that that he is speaking about the prince that shall come that Daniel speaks of in chapter 9, uh, right after he talks about the Mashiach, the anointed prince, is cut off, not for himself, but for the Jewish people's sake. All right, now... Notice here, though, he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver. Rome controls all the financial wealth of the world practically in their own hands. And uh, they are the richest entity on the planet Earth. A lot of people may not realize that nor believe it, but it is true. All right, now, and over all the precious things of Egypt. All right, now. How, where do you, what do you mean, Brother Steve? How, would you say, how do you think that he has control of the Egyptians? Well, guess what? Egypt has discovered one of the largest gas and oil reserves off of its northern border in the Mediterranean that you could ever imagine. Well, guess who actually has all the rights to be able to get that out of the, out of the ground for the Egyptians? It happens to be the Italians or the Romans in this case here. So yes, he has and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. Well, what does it mean that they'll be at his steps? I proved not too long ago how that the Vatican, who has a very strong sharehold in the Gulf Oil International, who has basically gone in there and pushed out the poor people in Ethiopia in order to be able to make sure they make enough room for the drilling of the oil in Ethiopia. Now Libya, for some reason, has fallen to the under the attack of NATO and their forces. And of course, the Pope of Rome runs NATO. So what do you think is happening there in the first place? So now, as you can see, he controls both of those. But then we run into this next verse here, verse 44. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. Now, I have always kind of held to this being China and, of course, Russia. Out of the north and out of the east. East is China, the north is Russia. But Scripture, friends, oftentimes has compound revelations. There's also both a physical and a spiritual side in, in, in Revelation at times. No doubt, as we see in the Bible, out of Egypt I have called my son. It applied to Israel, coming out of Egypt by the hands of Moses and Elijah, excuse me, Moses and Aaron. But it also applied to Yeshua. Out of Egypt I have called my son. A prophecy with a compound revelation or a compound fulfillment. In this case here, 
It is, I do believe, it applies to both China and Russia in an agreement that they may have, and it does trouble the Vatican because neither one of them are really playing the ball that the Catholic Church would like for them to do. And it will cause the Vatican to send his NATO forces in with the full force of everything, ships and everything, as the book of Daniel speaks about as well. But I begin to really wonder, and I just shared this with my wife the other day, with Yana, and I said to her, honey, I said, tidings, I wonder what the word really is in Hebrew. So I went and I looked it up out of curiosity to see just exactly what the tidings are. Because I already know that when he says he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, I already knew that he would be a part of the building of the third temple. But it's not doing it for the Jewish people, as he would call it, a temple for all nations. That's why the Pope really wants the temple built as well. It's a place for himself. The Jews just don't realize that that's what he's doing it for. So I caution my Jewish brethren to really take note of what the Pope of Rome is trying to do in their country, just like trying to take Mount Zion from the Jewish people. And even the Greek Orthodox Greek, they all have control over what is going on there on Mount Zion. All right, let's get into this. So in verse 44, what does it say here? Again, in the King James Version, it says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. All right. Mem Dalet is the Hebrew uh, uh, verse for it, 44. It says, Ushamaot Yabahalahul. Luhu. Excuse me. All right. And Mimazora. Okay, this is your Hebrew version of what's being said here, but now I'm going to break it down. Let's take a serious look. All right, in comparison, when we look at the first part here, first part here where it says that tidings comes to him and he is well let's back up for a second but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him all right that's what that's what we read in king james but i begin to look at that now the first part in here ushamaot all right shama is to hear to hear something the vav at the beginning there it's uh actually called a cholam vav there it's and and hear or in the plural, shamaot, see, ve uh, shamaot. So what is it? He is he, there is something that they're hearing, and he hears. See, he's hearing something, and it tells you where he hears it from. Mimazra, uh, okay, from the east, u mitzafon, and from the north. But the word here for north, tzafon, is actually a synonym in Hebrew. It means north, but it also means hidden. Something that is hidden. All right. Now, I want to share with you a conjecture on my part here. I just want to share something with you, but I'm going to dovetail it through the Word of God, and we're going to look at this. I believe that this prophecy is a compound fulfillment right here. And he hears from the east and from the hidden, possibly, causing him to panic. In other words, some type of tidings. Tidings is a good word in this case here because there's something that he's heard that bothers him and it's not just bothered him, not as we see here, trouble him. This is causing him to panic. And in his panic, is what is this panicking from? From what he has heard from the east and from the north. Now, some might think it is China and Russia, and no doubt, maybe in the natural, that is a sign that is there that does cause a troubling for him. But I believe it's deeper. As I looked into this, and I really began to prayerfully consider this, and I thought, what if that east represents the coming of Christ out of the east? And what if the north is actually the word for from the hidden one, Saphon? See, like the Sufanecha, 
your hidden ones we find in Psalm 83. So keep that in mind as we look at this. And I know it's a little confusing. Now, again, what is it about China and Russia? The part, uh, partnership de uh, deepens as we see here on January 2016. Uh, where Russia and China have a deeper relationship between China and Russia became noticeably closer in the past year and in the numerous agreements they have appended their signatures to come to fruition. They are apt to become still closer in 2016, is reported by Foreign uh, Policy Research Institute. So there is a troubling aspect for the head of NATO, which is the Roman Catholic Church, as we see by all the negotiations, including that of John Kerry, and Netanyahu going to Rome to do their negotiations now. See, the Pope is always engaged with negotiations. The Iranian crisis was also done in Rome by uh, John Kerry. Okay, so Rome is always involved in these things here. So yes, the, the North and East can also be a troubling tiding for him as well. But I really have begun to look at this in a very interesting light. Let's look at Psalm 83. Psalm 83, For lo, thine enemies make atonement, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head, their leader in other words. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. Who? David's people. Who are David's people? The Jewish people. And consulted against thy hidden ones. Thy hidden ones, yes, exactly. Al Al Amcha, see, and then we drop into here. Uh, al Tefanecha. All right, upon your people, but they have consulted against your hidden ones. Now, Chuck Missler actually asked me this, walking down the hallway in his office one day. Steve, do you think that that might be? the raptured saints? Well, you know, I pondered it for some time, and then I finally, I wrote Chuck back, and I told him, I said, Chuck, I don't believe it. I, I said, you know, remember we talked about this at your place one day. I said, I don't believe it's the raptured saints. I said, there's only one group that have actually been hidden, and that was Moses and Elijah. They're the hidden ones. And we know they're hidden because they appeared in a vision on Mount Transfiguration with Yeshua. And what did Yeshua even say? Tell the vision to no man. It's a secret what's going on right there. They're hidden away for a future work that they're going to do. You don't think that they're not alive and ready to go? Sure they are. They have said, as the scripture says, Come and let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. Who's going to do this? Not the hidden ones. It's that confederacy that have built themselves together. Even today, what are they doing? They're trying to take the name of Israel out of everything. They take it off the, off of the, uh, out of, uh, off the maps, out of history books. They want to replace everything with Palestine. The Catholic Church is the number one for that. They don't use Israel in anything. Everything, they call it the Holy Land or, the, or Palestine. They never let the name of Israel come and let us cut it off. And by the way, you go to verse 6, and who is it? Esau, Obadiah, as we've always seen, Obadiah clearly identifies Esau as being the modern-day Romans from the very time that, he, that we can see that. All right, so anyway, this is a little confusing, guys, and I don't mean it to be confusing, but let me just share with you. I want to break it down so you can see this right here. All right, in Daniel 11.44, on your screen, let me point to this for you guys, okay? It says right here, and I think this is big enough for you guys to be able to see it, uh, the Vav here means and, the Mem uh, means from, and from Safon, and from either the north or and from hidden. All right? And you have here in Psalm 83, Al Tzaponecha, all right? But the root right here, Tzaphon, Tzaphon. Now, this last letter looks different to you because it is, it is a, uh, uh, the letter here, when you have a final letter, in using certain letters like noon, a final noon uh, is a long noon. It has a different characteristic look, different letters in Hebrew. I'll, when I go to teach in Hebrew, I'll share that with you and what, what, how that works. Certain letters like that is called a final sofit is the way we say it in Hebrew. So this noon here is a final sofit. Um al-tzufonecha. Tzufon, tzufon, 
Both of them are synonyms, one meaning hidden and the other meaning north or either way could be exchanged either way. I believe that there's a good chance that Daniel 11.44 was speaking of hidden. You'll see why I say this as we move on. So let's look at this again. Again, we have up here, all right? See, and, and, he, and, and what he is basically, and he hears, see? Then it goes into what causes that panic, and he hears what makes him to panic, but he hears it from the east and from, some, from the hidden ones, perhaps. Perhaps, okay? Now, watch what we have here. This is where it may be to make more sense to you in what I'm saying. We could say, and he hears tidings from the east and from the north, and it causes him to panic, all right? But, see, the actual verse here, 1144 in King James, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. See, that's right there. Yavahalahu. Uh, that's the word for troubled, but troubled is really not a good translation. Panic is a better translation. So let's say, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall panic him. See, therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. All right. Now, notice though, if you look at Daniel 11.44, according to KJV translation, and even in Jewish Bibles, it's translated very similarly. So it's nothing against KJV. They're translating it more from a literal standpoint. All right. Not literal the way I'm translating it, but from what it appears to be for them. But if tidings out of the north and out of the east causes him to go and destroy and utterly make away many, that has nothing to do with a war between the north and the east. That's what troubles me. And that's something I realized. And it's also something that is heard. That's why it says tidings, all right? Now, if I look at it literally, I actually translate it literally as, and he hears from the east and from the north or from the hidden, causing him to panic, and he goes out with great rage to destroy and confiscate many or boycott many. The very word right there can be used either way, confiscate or boycott many. All right, so he goes out with a great rage to destroy and to confiscate many. Looks a little different than from great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many. Hmm. That confiscation, see, that could, that could, see, what, what is to confiscate to begin with? Confiscate is when you do something without authority. You take something without authority. Do you realize what's going on in the Middle East right now when, the, when they have taken, NATO is trying to take Syria? It's confiscating lands that do not belong to them. You remember in one of the apocryphal books I shared with you a little while back and everything, it said the same thing. They would for, uh, greed for themselves, gather lands unto themselves. See, that's the confiscation. All right, now, this is where I'm getting at. Look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Maybe that puts it into perspective. Look at Daniel 11, 44, K KJV version. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy it and utterly to make away many. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. You see where we're going with this right here? Notice the part, because he knoweth. All right? That's the part right there at the beginning. And he hears from the east, Christ is the one that comes out of the east, and from the hidden, see, if it's translated, let's say if you translate it as hidden, or hidden ones, causing him to panic. That's why we saw in Psalm 83, they have consulted against thy 
hidden ones. Why? Because that Antichrist spirit that is on the earth today knows the two witnesses are coming. And they're trying to figure out what to do about it. You have to understand, the Pope of Rome right now has been trying to bring about a one world government, a new world order. He's trying to get a hold of Israel, take everything from the Jewish people in order to do what? To fake a millennial reign. But what is troubling him? The coming of Christ. Something he's heard from the East and from the hidden ones, the two witnesses, this troubles him a lot. And so he knows he has a little bitty time. Now, the thing is, I don't think the devil has been cast out quite yet. If he had already been cast out, then that little time, the three and a half years that he gets to play around here on earth, he would already be in a mass fury. We're only seeing the preliminary part of this. You understand? Only the preliminary side of this are we seeing right now. All right? So Satan has not been cast out, but when he is cast out, he knows that he has a short time. See, in this case here in 1144, tidings, he's heard, he hears. He already knows because he knows the coming of the Messiah is at hand. And also the two witnesses will have begun to start their own testimony. So he knows he has but a short time. Now, let's look a little deeper with this. All right, now, Moses and Elijah are the hidden ones in this case. And how do we know it? We, have, we actually have scriptures to back it up for both of them. Watch this, Jude 1.9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses and durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Why is he disputing about the body of Moses? We have to remember, Satan is the angel of death. So when you die, unless you go on a rapture or, some, or something similar to that, the devil gets your body. Corruption. But corruption did not set in on Moses' body. Or if it did, Moses knows, or Satan knew nothing about it, and that's what troubled him. That's why he argued with Michael, the, uh, the archangel, about the body of Moses. He wanted to know where it was. God hid him. All right? God hid him. Moses' body away. Is that right? God hid him. And that's why we see they consulted against thy hidden ones. Oh, it's not up there. Sorry. I forget I'm changing the screen here. Alsafanecha. Uh, All right? But he's not there. And notice about Elijah the same thing. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not do nor reign these, these years, but according to my word. They won't come, right? And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith that is before Jordan. So God tells Elijah to go hide, and finally God hides him by taking him up in a chariot of fire. Couldn't nobody find him. See, God tells him to hide to start with, then God hides him himself. Now, let's keep going with it. Another comparison here. All right, now, this is going a little, this is in the next part of the verse right here. Okay, vayatse bachema gadola. All right, this is one that I thought was very interesting because of the way that it's actually worded. Let's, let's back up a little bit. They'll go back to, all right, let me get you right back. Uh, okay, maybe I didn't have it there like that. All right, I'll just bring you right back here in English, all right? But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy. All right, that's where we're at now. He goes forth with great fury to destroy. But the word here in Hebrew, vayatsa, uh, yotse, or yatsa, is to exit. And he exits, or he leaves, see? He leaves with a great rage. All right? Now, what, did, what does Satan do over here? The devil has come down unto you. If the devil has come down, the devil has exited heaven. See, 
It's not like this guy here that's going on in Daniel 11, 44. It's not like this guy is coming to do something. This guy left from somewhere to do something. And I believe it's Satan coming upon the Pope of Rome. And he has left heaven. And he's come down. And he has, what? With a great rage or great fury. Why? Because he's angry. He ain't got much time left and he knows it. All right? Then to do what? To destroy and to confiscate many. All right? He's coming to confiscate, to seize without authority. And not only is he seizing all the lands around Israel today with his NATO forces, but he's also trying to seize Israel. He doesn't have authority to seize Israel from the Jewish people, but he's going to do it, and he's going to destroy. All these wars all around Israel and the Middle East are caused by the Vatican. And notice, he doesn't care about the Christians. And when you look at Revelation chapter 12 there, you find out he's killing all those believers. Do you see the Pope? What does he do? He doesn't rescue the Christians. He goes and rescues the Muslims. When he has the opportunity to rescue the Christians, just like Obama did, but no, they rescue the Muslims instead and throw the Christians under the bus. Watch this. Revelation 12, verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our, of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Remember, Christ comes into the eastern gate in Jerusalem, right? See, the tidings out of the east they he's heard this and it troubles him now this is what's happening satan's in heaven and he says and i heard a loud voice saying in heaven see satan was there when he heard it that's what i'm talking about the scripture the tidings is, is the word shama for to hear see he didn't hear just one thing he heard two things he heard one about that the heaven has been given over. Christ is going to reign. He's thrown out. Daniel eleven forty four is all about Satan hearing what's going on. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the, by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. See, Satan was cast out down here. And see, I don't think he's cast out as of yet. But the Pope of Rome with his crusade of NATO, they're already crucifying and beheading the Christian people. And the Christians, that the you know, here's what's funny. Coptics and everything else, they behead them. They love not their own lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth uh, and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you having a great wrath because he knows. Why? Because he was there. He heard it. All right? Yes, but a short time. Let's move on. And when the dragon saw that he was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. They're about to persecute Israel. See? She was a Jew. A Jewess. Mary. They're going to persecute the woman that brought forth the man-child. I believe that represents Israel. And, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place as she has nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. By the way, that's three and a half years. Now I'm going to get to this. It's going to blow you away, the two wings of the great eagle and she has nourished. It's going to blow you away to find out what that is. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as the flood after the woman. He might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the, and the earth helped the woman. And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which do what? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Don't. Try to tell me God doesn't want you keeping the Ten Commandments because that's the commandments they're keeping. And I'll prove it to you in a moment. You'll see. Just bear with me. 
Bear with me. I'm not talking about Levitical law, 613 laws. No, that's not what he wants. That is, that is uh, a bunch of statutes that were given from Mount Sinai. God wants you to obey what was given from Mount Horeb, and that's the Ten Commandments. All right, let's look at this. Now, the cool part about this, Revelation 12, 14, look at it again. And the woman, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half time from the face of the serpent. God's two witnesses, Moses and Elijah, are those two wings of the great eagle. I'll show you by the word how that is. Look at Exodus 19, 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptian, and how I bare you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Didn't God say to Moses, I have come down to deliver them. God used a personal pronoun. I have come down to deliver them. And then he turns around and says to Moses, and I'm sending you. And how did God say he did it? And how I bear you on eagles' wings. The two, Moses and Aaron, they were the two witnesses then. And where did they go? To the wilderness. What's going to happen here? And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness. You're going back into the wilderness again. And it's not just limited to the house of Judah, friends. This is the house of Israel as well. That's a lot of believing Christians that are the house of Israel. Why does it say you'll take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, show us your ways. We hear that God is with you. Oh, friends. Watch what happens now. Watch, watch it now. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of a flood. See, that's what the devil does. That's what the Pope is doing. He cast out of his mouth. In other words, he says, NATO forces. Doesn't the Bible say, the people are multitude. The waters which thou saw us was the multitudes of peoples and nations. So what does he do? He casts out of his mouth. In other words, he just speaks and says to his Roman soldiers, go down there and kill all this group here or go invade this country here. He sends his NATO forces. See, that's what he does. Water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. Revelation 11, 5, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth. Remember what God does with the two witnesses? And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Not that it's literal fire coming out of their mouth, just like in this case here. The serpent is not that a literal water comes out of his mouth. It's just when he speaks through his little puppet there, the Pope of Rome, then He'll bring those soldiers in to do the war. In this case here, what happened? Elijah spoke when, there were five, when the armies come after him. He spoke the word and God sent a fire down out of heaven and devoured them. So it'll be a supernatural thing that takes place. All right, That's, there you have it. All right, another one. Again, Revelation 12, 17. And went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep what? The commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. What is that? I said, I'd tell you what it was, right? Here it is. Malachi 4, verse 4. And don't forget, what did Jesus say when they asked him the question? I thought this was right after Mount Transfiguration. Keep in mind, John the Baptist is dead. And they ask him the question, I thought the, the scribes say that Elias is to come first. Jesus says, truly Elias or Elijah shall come, that's future tense, and restore all things. But I say unto you, he's come already, and they did to him what was listed. He dealt with it in a compound way, and he does the same with Malachi 4. He actually applies part of verse 6 to John. When he says, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, Jesus applied that to John. But he left off, left off the part that says, and the heart of the children to their fathers. But watch what, this is what's important though. 
Remember, Revelation 12, 17 says that, and he went to make war with the remnant of her seed, that is the children of the woman, in other words, the children that are believers of the very remnant of Mary, because what is Mary's, what's Mary's seed? Mary's seed was Christ. She believed, she is, that's the woman's seed is Christ. The remnant of her seed are those that believe in Yeshua, HaMashiach. See, and, and this remnant do what? They keep the commandments of God. You don't believe that God doesn't want you to keep commandments and take it out with God. He said so. And have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Watch this. Malachi verse 4 in chapter 4. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him, in unto, into, unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. That's your Ten Commandments. That's what came down off of Mount Horeb. And when God records that in Deuteronomy, He gave them the Ten Commandments and two statutes. And the Bible said He added no more. Ezekiel in chapter 20, around verse 25, 26, 27, 28 there, states that because they refused to obey God's commandments, then He gave them that Levitical law. That's the 613 extras. Minus 10. All right? Or 12, that is. Because of the two statutes. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. John died. There was no great and dreadful day of the Lord. We've had several organizations that claim today that they had their leader was Elijah the prophet. They've come. They've died. There's still no, no uh, dreadful day of the Lord. Now, some might say, well, you know, 50 years, 100 years, whatever the case may be, is not that much time in God's way of thinking. Okay, I would agree with that. But I can prove to you that when the ministry of Moses and Elijah are finished, that God, within a, just a few days, if he doesn't hide away his bride at that point there, you won't survive. There's your dreadful day of the Lord. It comes right after they are raised up from the dead and then Christ parts that Mount of Olives and the wrath of Almighty God will fall upon this earth. That's the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And what is it? Remember Moses, my servant. There's one witness. And behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet. There's your other witness. The two witnesses to do what this time? And to turn what? And the heart of the children to their fathers. Which fathers is this here? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob always long to see the coming of the Messiah. All right? John comes and turns the heart of the fathers to the children. They long to see the Messiah. He turns their heart, turns the father's heart to the children, but the children didn't receive it. But what's happening in this day? This time, Israel, according to Zechariah chapter 12, they will look upon him who was thrust through and they will separate each one to their own family and they will mourn as a family lost their only son. There, the heart of the children now is being turned to what the fathers wanted and that was the Messiah. That's what the two witnesses come to do, friends. And by the way, that is exactly what you see in Revelation 12, 14. And the woman were given two wings of a great eagle. See, she's given the two witnesses that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she has nourished what she has fed spiritually for three and a half years, for a time and a times and a half a time. That's three and a half years right there. See, Moses went up unto God, and what did he say? And how I bear you on eagles' wings. I mean, every bit of this is incredible, my friends. Every bit of it. And what did we have in Daniel 11 here? Oh my gosh, get it right back here to the very beginning here. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. But what is it really saying here? It says right there, and he hears from the east and from the north or from the hidden, th hidden ones and causes him panic. Causes who panic? Causes Satan to panic. Why? Because he is thrown out of heaven. He hears that God is now reigning. He's thrown down to earth. He has but a little time. And what does he do? He comes to destroy and to confiscate, to take 
everything that he can. And what does he mean by confiscate? Why is he going to confiscate? He's confiscating what? Israel. He wants to take the land, friends. Not just destroy, but take their land. To do what? What is that? This is how you know it's confiscate. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about this till just now, friends, and I don't even have it on here. What happens in Daniel 11, 45? He's going to build his tabernacle there. Isn't that what it is? I think we do have it here. Let me find it. Let's, let's back it up real quick. Ooh, here it is right here. See, not utterly make away many, but and to confiscate much. What? The land of Israel. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his foul palaces between the seas and in the glorious holy mountain, Mount Zion. He can't get it there unless he confiscates it, takes it without authority, and he does away, destroys many by doing what he's doing. He's got the, he, that's why, why do you think he did this to the Syrians? He's trying to get his United Nations forces there to overrun Israel. Oh my God, friends, there you go. Glory to God. I'm about ready to have, as a Pentecostal, it's I'm about ready to have a Jubilee right here. Anyway, God bless you. Stand with us. Thank you for supporting this work uh, that we're doing here. And I just trust that you will continue to be uh, a help to us because your love for this ministry is what keeps us moving along as well. We're in it together. God bless you and thank you. I hope this helps you. Baruch Hashem. Amen.